Hello. Hey, how are you? Hey, there we go. Not too bad. How are you keeping? All right. Good Thanks. to talk to you. Uh, let me just say that I'm actually a, a quite a big fan of, of your series. I think your your videos are amazing. Wow, thank you so much. That means a lot. Whenever we hear like people who actually make games, especially, you know, some of the best games ever, <laughs> watch our stuff, it's like the most humbling thing in the world. So uh, thank you so much. Uh, yeah, no problem, no problem. It's always fun to talk about uh, the good old days at uh, Dundee. So, um, you know, anytime. So what are your, um, you know, strongest memories of your time working on Space Station Silicon Valley then? Um, it's really just a camaraderie. It was a small team, it was just 10 people. Um, so four coders, maybe three artists, three level designers, something like that for most of the time. Grew a little bit at the end. And, uh, you know, we do everything together, like typically go out drinking on Wednesdays and then again on Fridays, just with the team or with the company. There wasn't a design document that we had to strictly follow. But because everybody talked to each other in the team, it all worked out in the end. You know, you feel like you can criticize other people and you can take criticism from other people. That's half the battle because then you, you can have an open discussion. Everybody listened to everybody. It was just really fun to work that way. So we finished uh, Space Station Silicon Valley in 99. I guess it was late 98, I guess. And in 99, they set up another office in Edinburgh because basically there was quite a few people like me that didn't really love Dundee. I mean, it was fun to work there for a while, but it's, uh, you know, couldn't see ourselves setting, starting a family there. So they set up an office uh, in Edinburgh, which is just an hour up the road. And, you know, I volunteered for it. And most of the Silicon Valley team uh, went there straight away. But it wasn't really a plan for what we we're going to do. We, you know, it was. We just went there and then we kind of sat there. I was like, okay, now what do we do? So what ended up happening is everybody started doing their own project. So it was Leslie and Aaron that said, well, why don't we work on GTA 3? Because, you know, GTA 1 was such a great hit. GTA 2 didn't do so well, but we can take it into 3D and, you know, they could see that that's, that's going to go somewhere. So they started doing that and literally within two weeks, like everybody just went, yeah, this is a great idea. So everybody sort of teamed up and we started doing it. And in fact, it didn't really come from management, it didn't come from New York. They just kind of let us do it for a bit. And then after maybe four or five months, they went, well, this looks pretty good. So yeah, okay, carry on, just do what you're doing. Whereas before it, it sounded like they were actually planning to give it to another company altogether because, you know, GTA 2 didn't, you know, wasn't really working out that well. Uh, but at that point, they just kind of went, okay, fine, you do GTA 3. Uh, Leslie Benzies did make a design document with everything specked out, like the weapons and the uh, sort of type of vehicles we have. But basically, I think everybody was pretty confident that it was just going to be, uh, you know, GTA 1 in 3D. There's some things that didn't really work that well. In GTA 1, they had like a, a lot of the missions you, you took through phone calls. Um, you know, that was really not something that we felt would translate that well to 3D. It was kind of weird to answer the phone everywhere. So we sort of ditched that idea. But I mean, these are all minor tweaks. I mean, the gameplay was just great. It was just a matter of making it 3D. And of course, 3D gives you more opportunities too. All of a sudden, the weapons are more interesting. So you can have, like, blow up this truck and there's multiple ways of doing it with a rocket launcher and the uh, grenades or whatever. So, you know, sniper rifle doesn't really work in 2D, but it works in 3D. So it just led to more interesting missions just because it was in 3D. Uh, now it was about 25 people. So basically the Space Station Silicon Valley team plus a few other people that have finished their projects and maybe some new hires. But it was still the same, we still sort of go out together and stuff. Uh, but it was just incredibly hard work. In fact, it was a lot shorter than Silicon Valley. Silicon Valley was about uh, three and a half years maybe and GTA was just two, two and a half maybe. Well, was crazy as Vice City though because that was just one year. In that year, we also did the PC version of GTA 3. So that year, it was it was a bit much. But the GTA 3 was fine. Yeah, it was just fun. <laughs> okay, so you're saying that like 25 people in over the course of like two and a half years made like the first <laughs> open world city game, and it, your your enduring memory was that it was a it was a good laugh. It was a good laugh. Yeah, and it was still time. For, you know, it is Scotland. It was still time to get pissed twice a week so it was all, it was all good. from my conversations with the early dma folks i'd come to understand that on the first two grand theft auto games sam hauser had more of an a or producer style role for the publisher bmg while dan did some q a work on the first game and had written the second game's intro from rockstar's offices in new york this office founded in 1998 when take two started rockstar after the acquisition of bmg interactive Dan has a writing credit on Grand Theft Auto 3, while Sam an executive producer credit. So I guess I wanted to know how involved the New York Rockstar office was in the development of Grand Theft Auto 3. 
And ultimately, what was work like under corporate ownership, especially for a bunch of folks who had worked at DMA? They were pretty much hands off with GTA 3, I would say. It was really up to us. And the game was completely designed around the missions. Like people would come up and say, oh, this would be a cool idea. Maybe we try this. And we tried it. And if it was fun, yeah, that's in. If it was not fun, it's like nothing to do with the story, basically. And then it was up to the story writers to. But it wasn't really a story. It's like you meet a character, you do five missions, you meet another character. Uh, in the future, in the later games, uh, New York sort of got more involved and took more charge of it. And they had their ideas about how the story would be playing out and the characters were more important. Uh, but at GTA 3, there was very little of that. I mean, it was mostly wrapping a thin story around the, uh, the missions, really. Doing small games are like really fun because uh, there's only so many people, so every person has like a lot of responsibility. So I can look at GTA 3 and say, oh, I did that, I did, yeah, whatever, the clouds, the vehicle AI, that, that. I can make a long list of things. But then as we moved along, like got more, more programmers, more artists, so everybody did a smaller piece. So at the end, you know, I only did like a little bit. Um, so it's just way more fun to work on smaller projects. And after GTA 4, uh, yeah, that for me was a little too, too big a project. What's, what's your memory of DMA? Do you think DMA came with you as well to Edinburgh, that it was still DMA during GTA 3? Um, and what is your sort of like memory of what DMA was, I, I guess, as opposed to what Rockstar North was? Um, I, I don't think of it as the same company. No, I think I think DMA stayed in Dundee and it sort of uh, uh, slowly dissipated into other companies and all the people that work there still. I think Dave Jones had a lot to do with it. I think the, the freedom had to do a lot to do with it. So yeah, no, it, it just became different. It became more corporate and not in a bad way, but more focused and more uh, sort of single track. Um, whereas in DMA it was all, you know, it was chaos. It was like interesting projects, interesting projects being canceled, new projects being started all the time. Uh, you know, that, that just disappeared. So now DMA was something that happened from 85 till uh, 99. And then it's sort of, as far as I'm concerned, it just kind of went away.